pressure looks good. Okay, good morning, YouTube chat. Let me know if you can hear me. I'm, uh, I'm here, still awake. It's been a live stream extravaganza this evening with everything that's going on. But it uh, looks like we're 5x5, five five. fantastic. So we are here once again to cover more Soyuz happenings. We covered the Soyuz launch MS-16 out of Baikonur earlier today. And we are back because the astronauts, who launched, astronauts and cosmonauts who launched earlier last night, this morning, I don't even know what time it is anymore, uh, are approaching the space station now. And so I've got Chris Gebhardt with me, and we are going to do a little bit of Q&A about Soyuz MS-16. Chris, how's it going? Well, I appreciate that you called it evening. Like, did I, say, what, I didn't <laughs> know what time it is. 30 in the morning here. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, at least it's 30 in the morning where we are, but it's definitely your evening because you have not slept yet. Um, I, it, it, we're here. We're here. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. That's all we can really ask for, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but yes, the um, the Soyuz crew who launched from Baikonur uh, five and a half hours ago are uh, about 45 minutes away from uh, docking to the International Space Station and arriving. So we are going to be here to uh, to cover that, to take your questions on the Soyuz. It can be about the launch this morning. Um, I'm sure many of you watching uh, probably were asleep when uh <laughs> when 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 Soyuz <laughs> lifted off this morning um so we'll take your questions on on that about anything to do with the space program uh but we'll be here probably for about an hour um yeah. they're scheduled to dock about 40 minutes from now uh they will be um docking to the uh the space facing side of the international space station on the russian segment to the poisk module right um so they will do that they'll do their standard fly around maneuver to align with the correct talking port and then come on in uh and link up with the space station i'm going to use a handy tracking app right now for the space station uh, that we use in some of our um um launch articles that will actually give you the position of the international space station at ah. A particular time gotcha so it looks like link up between soyuz and the space station will occur over the atlantic ocean okay. um if it occurs right when it is supposed to at 10 15 uh they will be several they will be mm, about 2,000 kilometers uh away from ireland and southern england okay. uh, out over the atlantic so it's funny you said that uh we've got the russian mission control in korolev russia here and you can see mm -hmm. the track just barely you can see the track going over the atlantic ocean uh, approaching ireland there right so right here on this i'll draw it in that's the track yeah right and depending, yeah, that's the track. And right. depending on um, that exact one that you had highlighted is the one they're on. Right. Um, yeah, depend, and we should get, depending on where we are, like above or below the station in terms of the uh, relative viewing angle, we should get some good views as it comes over Colombia uh, and Puerto Rico gotcha. as well. So it goes directly over those countries, yeah. Nice. It looks like they're replaying the launch from earlier today. So this would be they a... are indeed yeah. yeah so if you missed the launch this was it uh the launch from baikonur the first flight of the soyuz 2.1 a rocket carrying humans on board um it was absolutely successful uh this is the first time humans have ridden the all digital upgraded for the 21st century soyuz rocket um and cool it, the launch went i mean and there you go i mean the launch just went absolutely perfectly the the soyuz delivered the soyuz rocket delivered the soyuz spacecraft yep. uh exactly where it needed to be for this fast track orbit yeah very cool so you say fast track orbit i mean it's been just a couple hours since they launched right they're not sitting in orbit for days they're almost there right 
Well, exactly. Um, and this is part of the, um, this is why they, they really wanted to do this specifically with the Soyuz to get to the station as quickly as possible because the Soyuz is a very cramped right. vehicle. Uh, right you can there. see it. Like these are just two of the three people. Um, <laughs> Uh, these are the two Russian crew members, actually, um, Commander Ivanishin and uh, Flight Engineer Wagner. Uh, Ivanishin kind of out of frame on the lower part, and Wagner up top. And then this is a view of the um, second stage of the shutdown and separation yep. of that stage and Soyuz popping out. Uh, I like there the you ping go. pong balls. Yeah. <laughs> well, those ping pong balls that pop up, do you know what those are? Um, <laughs> I I, I don't actually. Um, I, I assume it's part of the separation sequence and system yeah. um, for like telemetry confirmation and, and and stuff like that. And then you can just see how quickly those solar panels just bang. Yeah, they just pop right know? out. <laughs> Jeez, they're like yeah. the, the ping pong balls are like curb feelers. So if you get too close to the ISS, they sort of bump into it. You know you're too close. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's not what they're actually for. Okay. He got. He has the news. And no, I'm we have color. a big docking probe on the on the uh, <laughs> front part of Soyuz for that. <laughs> I I will say really quickly. Uh, every time you see the the astronauts cosmonauts sort of packed into that Soyuz, you may look at it and say, "Oh wow, that's actually not that packed." They have the big bulky spacesuits on. Yada yada yada. If you ever get a chance to see a flown Soyuz capsule at a museum, right? Look around because there's a lot of flown Soyuz capsules out there. Look inside of it if you can and see how tight it is. The astronauts are sitting shoulder to shoulder. I know Intrepid Museum in New York City has one when we're able to go to museums again. And then um, Museum of Flight has one as well out in Seattle. But you sort of see the picture and you're like, oh, it's a fisheye lens. Oh, there's probably lots of room. There's not much room. And if you see one in person at a museum, they are really packed in here. So here's the ISS graphic, Chris. You were saying where it was going to dock. That's what's there right now, right? Yeah. So, um, so if you go so where progress 74 is directly yep. above that that's exactly it there, there you go. go so use ms16 perfect Thanks, perfect TV. i love when, I, I love when the nasa graphics um work absolutely perfectly um i, I texted them i was like all right we're ready for the iss graphic now so <laughs> yeah. yes exactly right um but uh, yeah, so that's where it's going to go. So you can see the overall layout of the International Space Station. Yep. And then this will be it for the station until May when, fingers crossed, Dragon will arrive at the International Space Station with crew and it will dock to the forward end of the space station. Right. Um, yeah. And we then there are our three crew members. Yeah. So the three crew members are in the Soyuz right now. They're they're not even an hour away from docking, and they have uh, they're still sort of packed in there now. When when they get up into orbit, they open up the orbital module, right? They have the seats they sit in, but don't they have another module? Do you know when they're on the fast track orbit if they get up and move around some, or do they just stay strapped in? So they do. They they have to get up and they have to move around okay. because so they're in the descent module, which is. So in this graphic, right? Right. Oh, that one. There's our or there's our orbital module where they'll actually dock. Yeah. This center part is where they ride for launch and entry. It's right. the only part of the Soyuz that survives to the end of the mission. I like it. And then there's the power and propulsion. Ah, pointing. There we go. The there. power and propulsion module right here with the solar arrays. Um. Yeah. Um. But anyway, yes, so they ride in the orbital module, which is sealed off. Uh, sorry, they ride in the descent module, which is right. sealed off from the orbital module. And then after they get to lit the to orbit, they open the hatches between the two and they enter the orbital module because that's where all of the docking equipment is. That's right. where everything you need really to function on, like for the crew to live functionally in orbit, that's where that is, where right. all of that is. Yeah. Um, it has 200, the orbital module, itself has 212 cubic feet or five cubic meters okay of um I, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry it has um 202 cubic feet or six cubic meters of internal volume okay but only five square meters and 177 cubic feet of that is livable livable for the crew. like space you can move around in you mean right that yeah that's very 77 cubic feet is very very small five yeah. cubic meters very small that's like you the, think like a new york apartment is small that's small yeah pretty much <laughs> um the 
internal volume of the descent module is even smaller. Right. Um, it is 2.5 cubic meters and just 88 cubic feet of space. Wow. Um, for crew living and that's, that's it that's all they have access to so they do get up they get out of the descent module they get into the orbital module they open the hatches between them right um yes af after liftoff and orbit insertion is complete yeah so everybody if you're just coming in uh joining us wondering what's going on it's like what is this this looks like it's a live view chris do you think this is from soyuz or is this from station this is from station this is from looking station at where the Soyuz should be. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, the station's cameras on the outside are looking, like the, the remote controllers on the ground are yep. looking for Soyuz, uh, and they will zoom right into it. Um, and we do expect they... to see the docking live, right? Like we're watching the docking live here. Oh, we will see it live, yeah. All right, yeah. good. Um, oh, and there's our graphic, good. Yeah. Uh, so you can see the Soyuz is almost directly on top of the International Space Station, exactly what we want. Um, uh -oh. So we should get visual tally-ho, it's called, um, on Soyuz here fairly uh, fairly soon. Um, fairly soon as yeah. everything progresses and proceeds toward, uh, uh, toward, docking. toward docking here yeah. coming up about 30 minutes from now. Gotcha. So, so here's the thing, y'all. While we're waiting for Soyuz to approach the station and actually dock, uh, we can do some Q&A if you have questions for us about what's going on. The best thing to do is tag us in chat. If you can tag at NASA Spaceflight, uh, that'll highlight it over here so we can see it. And we'll see if we can't grab some of these questions. I'll pass them over to Chris. And while we wait, we'll answer some of your questions. Again, we won't be able to get to every single question. There's always so many good questions that come through. Uh, but we are planning on watching the docking. We're going to be here. And if you have questions about what's going on, please try to tag us in chat so that it highlights as a as a question here so yeah. uh let's see um and there are a couple questions in chat that i want yeah, to get to right it. now um because there, there are people asking when will demo 2 launch when will the spacex vehicle launch crew um and there are a lot of conflicting answers being given in chat so here's the official answer um uh the official answer is there is no hard target date yet um, NASA and SpaceX have only said publicly mid to late May for Demo 2's launch uh, to the International Space Station. Uh, so that that is that. So other things that are up there in chat um, are not the official dates that either NASA or SpaceX are have given or are potentially working toward. Um, they have not set the firm date that they'll target yet. Um, so um, that is what we have right now for that particular mission. Gotcha. Uh, you want me to grab a couple more questions here? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I just had looked over and saw yeah, that yeah, no going worries. through on chat. So I was like, that's a good one to, to get right off the bat, yeah. Cool, so here's one. Kelly Hughes asks, uh, is this the last American to use Soyuz? Is it all gonna be SpaceX from here on out? Right, excellent, excellent question. Uh, the answer to that is no, it's not the last American uh, to launch on a Soyuz. Um, uh, there, there will notionally as the, as the crew vehicles from the US come online and receive their certification, there will under normal circumstances always be one Russian flying on the US vehicles right. and one American flying on the Russian vehicles because we always have to have one American and one Russian on the station at all times. Look, this is look. really cool. This is from the Soyuz. Yeah. This is what Soyuz is seeing out of its forward docking camera and docking port. You can see a ghost image of the station behind all the Cyrillic writing. Yeah. What I want to draw your attention to, and Doss, if you can highlight yeah, this. Yeah, I got it, I got uh, it. Bottom left hand uh, portion of the screen here. Right there. Yes. So that is distance range of Soyuz from the International Space Station. So they're 1.1 kilometers away from the station right now. Gotcha. The one just below that, the 3.6 M slash C, is the approach rate in meters per second. Okay. So those are the two numbers you really, really want to see and pay attention to when we're on this graphic. Uh, the 
as the distance closes, right. the meters per second closure rate will drop gotcha. significantly. Um, so we're uh, approaching the station at 3.4 meters per second, a kilometer out yep. right now. That will drop to about one-tenth of a meter per second oh, at wow. docking. No yes. kidding. And y'all can see yeah. the uh, you see the ghostly image of the station. It's right sort of there in the middle. It's sort of moving yep. around. But that's the space station. <laughs> That is indeed, um, cool. and that was really cool, but I want to get back to this question um, sure. because it's not the last time. Um, while there will not be a Russian on the first operational flight of the SpaceX Crew Dragon, it'll be three NASA astronauts and one Japanese astronaut. Yep. Um, that's not the norm, um, but the next Soyuz to launch up to the space station, currently scheduled to launch on the 14th of October, will include two uh, Russian cosmonauts, the two that were originally supposed to fly on this mission before one of them was injured um, and had to swap with their backup crews. And NASA astronaut Stephen Bowen will fly up with them on the third seat in that Soyuz um, as well. Uh, and uh, looking beyond that to Soyuz MS-18 for the spring of 2021, a year from now, uh, Kate Rubens from NASA will fly on that Soyuz up to the International Space Station uh, as well. And that's about as far out as we've gotten with the the rotations gotcha. of what we're going to do. But yeah, there will always be an American launching on Soyuz. There will always be, under normal conditions, a Russian on the American craft. Um, the reason there isn't a Russian on the first flight of um, the Crew Dragon right. Uh, we don't really know for certain, but the, the, the sort of here's where Russia is in their process right now. You can see the camera panning. To yeah, try to I was find like, the did Soyuz they find it? There. Ah, well, and there's a much better image of the station. You can see we're uh, 0.69 kilometers from it now. Wow. Um, and you can see the flare as they're adjusting the camera. Yeah, they're there. adjusting but, um, the, the gain on the camera or something. Look at that. <laughs> but But what it appears is that Russia just was willing to accept the, their Soyuz wow. approaching the station. Perfect. They found it. Look at that. Look at that. Here it comes. Um, That's such a good but shot. The, the, the most likely reason is that Russia does not want to increase their crew presence on the station from two back up to three. Right. Until the NAUCA module, their big science laboratory, is launched later this year. Gotcha. So with that and... Russia is a little, uh, you know, uh, that that seems to be the biggest and most likely reason that Russia declined the seat. Right. Uh, is they just didn't want to increase their crew size back up to three. Look at that but shot. <laughs> look at this absolutely gorgeous shot. Um, so <laughs> using the app right now, the International Space Station is currently over the South Pacific, okay. tracking northeast toward... Um, uh, toward Venezuela and Peru. Gotcha. Uh, in South America, it will fly directly over those two countries before exiting out over the Caribbean, and then passing directly over Puerto Rico. Gotcha. As well as it swings out over the Atlantic for docking. Um, what's really cool is that if this were twilight in the U.S., its next orbital pass will actually bring it directly over the Kennedy Space Center. Oh wow. Uh, so if it was night, we could actually see it. Look up and um, see it, right? Yeah, which is really, really cool. I want to I um, control the camera. I want to, like, point the camera back over. Like, wake up, person. I know, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, back to Soyuz. Uh, but you can see another Soyuz, or most likely a progress, yeah. making a, a photo bomb here. Ah, there they heard are. me. They heard me. <laughs> they heard you. Chop, chop, they Houston. They heard you. Because the cameras are well, and the progress and the progress is our camera shy. They don't like they don't like being filmed while docked to yeah. the space station in their natural <laughs> environment. So you know you had to move the camera so the progress didn't get nervous. Do you know if these cameras are controlled from Houston or they control from Russia? Do we know that? Uh, so the crew can control them. Russia can control them, and uh, Mission Control Houston. Gotcha. In Texas can control them. Look at this. Yes. They're like enhanced. They're putting it back in the same spot there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. Somebody asked real quick but what I mean, app you were using. What was the name of the app that you're looking at? Or Oh, yes, yes. Tar Sorry, I totally meant to see it. Uh, it is called Go ISS Watch. Uh, okay. So Go ISS Watch. 
all one word. Um, I'm gonna see if I get a link a for you. Yeah, it is an absolute phenomenal app. It's free. There are paid add-ons where you can see other satellites aside from just um, uh, the space station. Uh, but it's a great app that um, that's really useful too. You can you can have settings so you can see where the actual ground track yeah. is, not just where it will pass over, but how the ground track moves. So I found um, a link to it on the Apple Store. I think is that one that I put. Yep, there. that I didn't that see should an Android be it. One. Yeah. But I posted. But that yeah, it's it's it. it's a really good app for seeing where the station is, where it's going to be at a particular launch, how far away. Like that's actually how I was able to figure out for our, our launch article yesterday that at the time Soyuz launched this morning, the station would actually be a thousand and eleven kilometers east northeast of the launch site. Gotcha. So here's, another, time. So here's it's, another question. Um, will the ISS ever be dismantled and made into a museum? Are we going to recover it? Are they going to deorbit it? Do we even know what's going to happen with the ISS? We do. Um, and a lot of people are not going to like it. Um, there is no way to bring it down. Uh, right? There is no, no way to, to get it back. The um, Starship. It, we will... <laughs> Come on, Starship. Starship. Just, Starship can get put all, all the Starship sections can... of it in Starship and bring it back. <laughs> I will. Kidding. Okay. I guess I should say, as of right now, okay. we have no way to bring it back. <laughs> there are no plans to do so. It would be immensely expensive to do that. Right. Um, just to put it in a museum. Um, no, the, the, the plan is just like the Russian space station near, we will send up most likely a Russian craft. Um, right that will do the deorbit burn gotcha and and bring the iss down over the southern pacific ocean uh graveyard away from shipping channels away from everything um and and that that, that is how we will dispose of the international space station when it's time to do so gotcha and hey chris we just got this in the studio if you want to talk about the chinese launch for just a second it looks like yes uh, yeah go ahead uh, well, give me the update first. Oh, I think I know so where we're going. The um, update that we just got from think... Thomas is that uh, we have confirmation that the earlier Chinese launch has failed. There was a failure of the third stage. <laughs> there we stage. go. So uh, third stage failure on the, um, on the, the um, Chinese launch that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. So... Um, just I saw that breaking yeah. it's all like breaking news did you do like coming in so I figured I would you know <laughs> oh and apparently Thomas is telling us that the satellite has already re-entered oh wow so it so it didn't even reach orbit wow. um that is uh ooh, not ideal um not ideal that'll be a setback um that'll be a setback for for China uh definitely with the long march um yeah. Uh, 3B, the Shenzhen 3B. So, yeah. Um, this but let's is, return to happier things. Yeah, Look at the definition on this video. It's Look crazy at how Soyuz. Fast it's and you can, see, you can see the clouds rising up into the atmosphere behind it. Look at that. Did y'all see these? As they are out. What did I just get? Oh, they just switched the Pacific. There. Hang on. Okay, yeah, there you so go. they are out over the, the Pacific, uh, still approaching uh, the uh, eastern part of Ecuador and Peru. Right um uh, uh, per their ground track and and where they're coming over uh here God. but yeah um grab just, another... just, just, just... yeah go ahead I'm, I'm ready to grab another question when you're ready yeah go for it go for it yeah all right uh it looks like on here seconds were labeled in c is that because this interface is yes. in russian and cyrillic characters correct gotcha yes so right there that was that was meters per second when it says m dash c it's not like hammer time or anything like that that's meters per second in uh right. I, I guess russian would be the right way to say it right so correct that right was, that was a good um, and a slight correction to what i said earlier um it, it's actually so it, it'll go over ecuador and colombia and uh the extreme northwestern portions of venezuela here on its ground track over south america it will miss peru by just a few hundred miles gotcha <laughs> 
And look at um, this. We were a kilometer away when we were talking a couple minutes yep. ago, and now it's under a quarter kilometer away. It was going three meters per second, and now it's going point two. Three point something meters per second, and yeah. we're down to point two meters per second. We're looking at yes. the numbers right here. If you're just joining us, this number is the distance to the station. So it's point two two three. I don't know why I just wrote over that, but whatever. It's point two uh, two two kilometers from the station, and the approach speed is. 0.18 meters per second right now so it's slowed way down and it's got a lot closer just in the time we've been talking i love this interface very very much so and it's also doing its fly around das if you uh if you can highlight just above the center x there yep you see off to the right hand side a little module sticking out i see this yep uh directly on the other side and of there's it. the other one that's the docking port. That's ah. Poisk. That's where we're going. So Soyuz is doing its fly around right, right now there. to align with Poisk and the docking module. Gotcha. But that is Poisk. That's where we're going today. Oh, and Cygnus is down below. You can see Cygnus. Yeah, Cygnus um, is right here. Off the radio. Yep, that's Cygnus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and there's the uh, the Soyuz Progress that's there, and then there is the Soyuz. Uh, sorry, there's the Progress that's there that you can see that Das highlighted. Earlier. Is that on the side right there? Yep, and okay. then there is a Soyuz that you can't quite see right at the top of the screen, right but it's right there um, behind those letterings. Uh, yeah. Letterings behind those letters. It's um, sort of off screen. <laughs> Yes, and you can see Earth now starting to come into view. So we'll actually be approaching um, because it's the space-facing side uh, that we're approaching, not the Earth-facing side. So we will actually see Earth in the background as we approach the docking port here gotcha. of Poisk. Um, so they are in their fly around. Docking is set for about 15 minutes from now. Yep. Um, technically, docking is expected at 10:15 Eastern, 14:15 UTC. Okay. But Soyuz has always have the tendency to be a few minutes early. Gotcha. Because uh, it's all automated. <gasps> so yeah. Yeah. So there's there's not an astronaut cosmonaut on board right now with a joystick like ch -ch 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 flying this. This is an automated. No, approach. although they have that ability. I've seen yeah. it happen. Um, <laughs> we have seen it happen. Yes, where they have to take manual control of the Soyuz. Um, but but yeah, no. It, this is all automated. Um, Soyuz will do everything um, by itself as it approaches Poisk. Um, yep. Via you, the Kurs automated rendezvous system. That's you can it. Really yep. see Poisk right now. <laughs> That is where uh, the Soyuz is going to end up. It is drifting a little bit, but that right there, the Soyuz is going to dock right here, right yeah. like that. Because at this point in the fly around, we're not overly concerned with um, precise alignment so much as getting it into the proper position above the station, right. then making sure your alignment is perfect, and then pressing in gotcha. for docking. And it's it's holding it's, right it's now. It's down to 0.07 meters per second. You can sort of see 0.06. Yes, it's, it's sort of stopped now. Remember, approach. right? So remember, that's the that's the approach speed. Right. So as they do the fly around maneuvers, it could be you're not strafing. necessarily getting closer to the station as you're flying around it. So that's why we've seen that approach speed really stop. Gotcha. Uh, but you can see the thruster firings on Soyuz right now. It's continuing um, its fly around for its alignment. Yeah. Uh, there to Poisk. Um, Did you'll see the flashes, like yeah. sort of how it, it gets a little bit brighter. Yep. Those are the thrusters firing. They're, wow. OK, that's not what I meant, NASA, but OK. <laughs> <laughs> so half of that was an exposure error. Yeah, but okay. you did see the flashes and the pulses of a vapor there as the thrusters are firing to align it with uh, with the docking module here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Focus. What, what's, in, what's interesting? What's interesting, and, and it's a cool parallel. The very first um, time that we did a fast track rendezvous with the station on a crew mission with the Soyuz. Yep. Uh, there's just incredible thruster firings you there. See Look, all at that. That. Look at like, that. Like, <laughs> I mean. Um, but the first time we did a fast track rendezvous, Chris Cassidy was actually a crew member on that Soyuz. No kidding. And he is a crew member on this Soyuz as well. As they now approach, uh, it'll be his second long duration mission. Wow. Uh, but third flight, look at that. What is My that? Gosh, can we bring up the audio? Uh, sure. I'm not getting anything right now. Let's Let me uh, check it. That's a lot of thruster firings. We've got audio yeah, now, Chris. Yeah, look I'll, I'll at relay. that. 
range is 200 Thanks to plenty of sunlight, getting a lot of views there. Of thruster firings as the Soyuz continues to fine tune. Fine tune? He just said that that's fine tuning. <laughs> yep, that's fine tuning, believe it or not. Uh -oh. <laughs> Soyuz just went crazy all of a sudden. <laughs> Look at that. But you know, and, but the, but this is Soyuz and its systems, uh, right? Talking to the Kerr's automated rendezvous system, right? Segment on the station, right? And 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 doing those proper alignments because you have to be, it has to be so precise before they will say you're allowed to press to dock it, right? Now, one thing Soyuz is also doing as it's doing its fly around is it's trying to maintain the orbital module constantly being facing the space station right 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 so it's not just flying around it's also having to flip itself around and rotate itself and maintain this alignment um yeah but i mean these thruster firings are just gorgeous of, of course we have a smart and you can see stars chat, in the background right? which is what i love every once in a while you see a star just go boom <laughs> I, I have to say uh, I have to say, of course, we have a smart elec in chat who says, you can't hear the thrusters firing. There's no sound in space. We didn't want to hear the thrusters firing. Like, psh, psh, psh. we wanted to listen to mission control to make sure that that, uh, that crazy amount of thruster firing was all nominal. So that's why we brought the audio up there. We weren't trying to hear the thruster firing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I can make noises if you want me to. <laughs> we can do the kerbal. Come on. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I interrupted. Yeah, so, so what was so what we'll see um now is a, a station keeping. In fact I, I believe that's where they should be right now where they're where they're maintain they're they're aligned, right? They're checking the alignment. Right. Um Soyuz will do a little wiggle um as the thrusters pulse to keep it to get it rock solid there. Um and then they will have the go command to initiate final approach. And yep. that is, of course, automated as well. And because it's space flight, we're going to just go with what it is, we'll make your own happens. assumptions. But if this is the docking port on, on station, right, this circle right. in my hand, this is why I say this is how it actually happens. Make your own assumptions. There is a probe a docking probe that sticks down from soyuz right and what you're trying to do is get the docking probe to be inserted into the capture ring of station it's behind you it's on your overlay behind you you can just point well up. yes so yeah, yeah, yeah there we go so that is the docking probe that has to be that has to go inside of this circular capture ring on the station and then the ring actually, and then it grabs the docking port and pulls Soyuz in. And then there are latches on the station side that uh, that drive into Soyuz, hooks that literally drive in to form the hard mate before right. they can then pressurize the vestibule and, and open the hatches and everything. Gotcha. It almost looks like we've got some like lens flare going on here now, as as if the sun is in. Well, just we do the right because angle. remember, as they're going, so they have now crossed Puerto Rico. They are over the Atlantic Ocean, east of the Bahamas, right now. Right. Um, as they continue to track outward, they will dock over the Atlantic. Um, uh, but you know, this is also you know, it's changing sun angles mm -hmm. because the station is moving so fast at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour, give or take. Um, that yeah, it's just the sun angles are changing. Yep, <laughs> that rapidly on orbit. Um, ah. Yeah. So this is a different but camera. You, it looks like this is a different camera because we don't have the Earth in the background. Which way is yes, the Soyuz so approaching? This like, is this is a camera on the station looking at Soyuz. Right. Um, when we had Earth in the background, that's when we we're on the Soyuz camera looking at the space station. Okay. Um, now that the fly around is done, when they were approaching, right, Soyuz was underneath the was station underneath and it. had to fly, had to fly up around and over top. And it's now will now basically come down. Let me see if I can draw that right quick. So so here's here's imagine the Earth, right? That's, that's a pretty sweet Earth, and you've got uh, the space station sort of flying here, and there's solar arrays, whatever. I'm not going to do a very good space yeah. station, um, but so ah. Soyuz <laughs> was underneath it, and it actually ended up 
around up here? Is that what was happening? Yep, exactly. Okay, because it, exactly. it, it's docking with the module that's up this way, right? Yes, the, okay. the, the module that faces outward to space. Oh, look, um, you can see the clouds behind it right now. So yes, it's you can. Down. Oh, and this wow. is over the Atlantic Ocean, um, and Poise is uh, in the upper in the upper right quadrant. It's right above that line. Right. Um, Just it's right, right above the x-axis. It's that's it. Yep, right, right there, there. Now, so if you want. Yep, that's our docking target today. That's, that's where we're going. Here. That's where we're going. Okay. Um, and we're uh, zero point. So we're uh, sixty meters, sixty-six meters from the International Space Station, closing at. Uh, two tenths of a meter per second. Right, you can see um, that right there. So we are on final approach um, and headed for uh, and headed for the International Space Station. So with that closure rate, we're about uh, five-ish minutes away. Wow. So they'll be a little early, they're right on the timeline, basically. They'll be a little early, uh, probably 10, 12, 10, 13 for contact and capture. Gotcha. Um, based on this um let's go ahead and pull up the audio sure. now um and 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 listen in uh as as soyuz comes in all right and folks the way we've got this set right now chris actually can't hear the audio that you can hear so i'll be listening and trying to sort of relay any call outs range is 50 and range rate is 0 0.2 Copy. She's just reading out the uh, the ranges and rates right now, 50 right, meters so away. I've actually got it pulled up on the YouTube feed. Cool, gotcha. Oh, what? And there is Soyuz. Look at that. Confirm SSRP docking and internal transfer command activation. Probe is extended, uh, latch is extended. Yep. Uh, hooks uh, open, SSRP uh, system is ready. Copy all. So you can see the probe is extended right there. The, the little it looks like a like a wizard's staff or something sort of sticking off the front. It's got a little ball on the end of it. You can see it right there. I I hate to draw on this though because it's such a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> right. God. I want to shake the hand of the person that delivered this camera to the International Space Station because this is a nice camera. <laughs> Well, you know, they, they spent a whole lot of time earlier in the decade, um, in 11, 12, and 13, um, upgrading the cameras outside yep. of the station. Under uh, and th and this, it's really paying off with these incredible views that we get of them coming on in. Um, away now from docking. I want to frame this correctly. I, I want to move Soyuz over to the other side so it's in the big black area. <laughs> Right now, it looks like it's about to dock with the top of your head. Yeah. So they should be probably about 30 meters, 25 to 30 meters from the station um, at this point. So a couple minutes. Yeah. yeah, they should be right on there a couple minutes from now. Wow. A little bit early, which is normal for Soyuz. Um, and people in chat who, who are saying like, oh, oh, remove your cameras and stuff like that. Um, we're here to provide commentary. I'm trying to watch it, and if we start to block it, I'll move the image around and stuff like that. But uh, we are uh, we don't just want to restream the exact same stream, right? So I'm watching right. it, and if I need to... And you know, Scott ahead. Rogers saying on our, on our, um, in chat that it's absolutely amazing how spacecraft can undergo hundreds of degree temperature swings every 45 minutes and in the, where they go from the top, well over so you know really on the 100 you degrees fahrenheit the you know um right at the in tip. daylight you know, much more than that and that's what to negative 200 to degrees fahrenheit in the day in the nighttime passes module, and that'll get retracted, you think the station's been up there since components of the station have been up there since 1998 going through those thermal cycles every 40 Five minutes. So you, yeah. It's just incredible what our spacecraft are built to uh, they, are built to a stand. Yeah. Ah, and see, now it's like me at a launch where the auto they forgot to take auto focus. Auto focus. Um, like, like, no. <laughs> it's a rookie mistake, and you hate to see it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Area of both of them. So I'm sure they'll get it dialed back in here in a second. exposed to the vacuum of space. It looks like it's getting better. There, there we go. go. Series of leak checks. Everybody in chat, yeah, you'll focus. That'll actually help. A little help. while for that to not only get pressurized, but to make sure that 
uh, the hatch or the pressure is equalized between the Soyuz, the vestibule, and the station itself. All right, here we come. We can see parts of the station there in the lower uh, left hand port side of the screen. Right. Now, um, so probably 10, 10, 15 meters now? Yep. I almost need a little context. I wish this camera would zoom out just a bit so you could see some more of the station, right? But it's just coasting in. It's just doing its thing. Yeah. All the sensors and, and I'm going to say docking radar. I don't actually know if it's docking radar, but it sounds cool to say that. Um, guiding it in. This is all automated for Soyuz here. And yeah. This is the digital Soyuz, right, Chris? This is the whole... It is. The MS series of, of spacecrafts oh. are, are digital, yes. Look, I like to point this out. You see this green piece right here? Yeah. Oh, don't move the camera. I was pointing something out. Do you see the green piece sticking up right there? That's a periscope, isn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a visual periscope that they can actually use to see past the front of the Soyuz. Because they can do manual docking. Yeah. Of, yeah of yeah. Soyuz to the station. So look at this, it's, oh, here we go. Ah, here we go. Uh, 14 meters away from the station, closing at one tenth of a meter per second. Wow. And you can see the docking target as well. Do you see this piece right here? Yes. That's actually a three dimensional thing, right? That's not just a, <laughs> it's not just a little circle yeah. on a plate or something. That actually has some depth to it. And if those lines are lined up, you know that you're in the right sort of orientation to meet with it because the docking part is actually off screen yeah up above our screen so they don't actually aim for the the docking port yeah, the they docking aim port is for this, this target here. this is the right docking they port. aim for the target right there yeah. and yeah and so you can it. see it coming on in nine meters away now oh that's cool that's just right on and the, the money words we want to hear are contact and capture yes that's what we want to hear so I'm going to bring the audio back up again. Yep. Range visual estimate is three meters. Three Just got meter? three meters. Copy. Contact. <sighs> Standing by for contact. <laughs> it's just coasting in like it's no big deal. You can see the 3D now, though. Contact. Hang on. Contact confirmed. Hooks engaged at uh, seventeen thirteen twenty one. Seventeen thirteen twenty one. Contact okay. confirmed. Hooks engaged. She just said. There we and go. Docking confirmed. Nine so thirteen a.m. Central Time. Ten thirteen a.m. Eastern Time. Wow. Fourteen thirteen GMT as the station was flying just about two hundred and sixty statute miles over the northern Atlantic. God. It's like no big deal, Chris. It just coasted in. I know. Just, just captured. So use MS-16 spacecraft docked to the International uh, Space Station. So where station. were they? Where were they right at? The at docking probe captured. Was they were the over the North Atlantic. Yeah, the North they Atlantic. were over the North Atlantic, Atlantic about 3,000 kilometers from England and Ireland. God. That just, they just made that look easy. But it's it's not a hard seal yet, right? What's the right terminology, Chris? It's, it's... No, so yeah, we don't have hard dock yet. Right. So um, what we're listening for now, and Das, I, I muted the audio, so you're going to have to tell me when we hear this. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so it's contact and capture is, right. is the initial soft mate. Basically, the docking probe has been captured by the docking ring. So they're not going to float away from each other. But what happens now is the docking probe is retracted, right. which pulls them in together. And then a series of hooks are literally driven into the two vehicles yeah. to hard mate them together. And then once that hard mate is complete, they'll go through leak checks of the vestibule before they open the hatches and right. enter the station. Right. So that was a good question over here. How long will it be before they open the hatch? Okay. Uh, hour and a half to two hours. Okay. So again, yeah. they don't just run up here and then they just whoop, knock together. Okay, hey, woo, let's go inside. Um, they make sure they have the seal. They sit there and they watch it. They make sure this, the vessel stabilizes because sometimes you can actually see Soyuz waggle a little bit, right, after it's docked. Mm -hmm. And they have all these checks that they go through to make sure the pressure is good. There's no leaks or anything. They've got the, the seal that they want before they're ever going to open up those doors. Because right. if you open up those so, doors when it's when you're not properly sealed that could be a big problem so it's it's not oh. something they take lightly 
Yeah. And you can see all the systems all green yeah. in the background, which is what we want uh, I can't right read now. any of those, but, but they're green, but, so. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, the, the, and the reason they don't press to hard dock right away or right. hard mate right away is because when you've got a huge vehicle like the station and a vehicle like soybeans and they're basically colliding with one another, a very controlled collision is how they do it. Um, you want to make sure that any dispersions, right, of wobbles in either of the stacks are completely dampened out right. before you drive the docking probe in and drive the latches. Um, what was fascinating, different vehicles react differently when they dock to the station. And one of the things that sticks in my mind to this day is um, Endeavor of the shuttle fleet had to do a slightly, had a different post capture and contact docking procedure and timeline that they had to use for Endeavor, but not Discovery in Atlantis, because for some reason, every time Endeavor came up to the station, and dock, Endeavor would just rock back and forth on that docking adapter more more so than Discovery and Atlantis would. And so different vehicles, literally of the same design, can react differently when they when they you know collide with the station. Sure. Right, and and it's just one of the little quirks of spaceflight, right? That, yeah. Huh. Excellent. Well, let me scroll through chat and see if we have anything there. We, we've already answered uh, how long will it take to enter the ISS. What's the needle on the docking port we talked about? Uh, oh, here's a good one. Do the cosmonaut astronauts on board the Soyuz talk to Russian mission control in English or in Russian? They talk to them in Russian. In Russian. Mm -hmm. And when the Russian crew members have to talk to Mission Control Houston, they speak in English. So they speak at the they speak the language of the Mission Control that they're talking to. Is, Indeed. Is it true that like like American astronauts or, or just non-Russian astronauts, I guess is the right way to say it, mm -hmm. um, do they learn some Russian before they go yes. on to Soyuz? They do indeed. They learn Russian. They have to be able to communicate uh, if needed. Wow. Um, with <laughs> ground controllers. So yes, the they labels, learn Russian. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's a pretty extensive language learning system um, that they that they employ. Um, for for the crew um, to make sure that everyone can speak the language that they need to to talk to the various control centers, gotcha. um, which becomes really important, right? Not not so much in the day to day running of the space station, where the American side will talk to the American mission control and the Russian side will talk to Russian mission control under normal right. circumstances, but when you have visiting vehicles like this arriving, and everyone has to be ready, right? Like. One thing that doesn't get a lot of attention um, on these arrivals of, of any of the craft is the sort of contingency procedures that are there and always in place so that if something goes awry and we have like a mirror situation where the progress of the Soyuz collides right. with the station, not the controlled way we want to do it for docking, but like an out of control collision that the crew can jump into the vehicles that are there right. and get ready to leave if they need to. Um, and that's always an ever-present thing, right? Especially when you have these vehicles arriving, leaving uh, like that, and you have to be able to, to talk to Mission Control Moscow, to talk to Mission Control Houston if you're over there. Because we've talked about it, right, that one of the reasons the, the Starliner and the Dragon on the U.S. side are designed to be able to ferry ten, uh, seven people at a time right. is because that will be the normal crew complement of the space station. And if everyone happens to be on the American side of the station when an emergency occurs and it's not feasible to get to a Soyuz, you've got to be able to get to a craft that can actually take you home. Right, because everyone on the you know, space station at any given time has to have a seat if they need to get off the station in a hurry. We don't Bingo. leave people up there Bingo. without a ride home, basically. Correct. The only time we ever considered it mm -hmm. was the final space shuttle mission. Um, when there was no shuttle to go up and rescue them, if Atlantis had been damaged during launch or a major system failure, right. uh, we had a plan in place that we would rotate down that final shuttle crew over the course of a year by launching... Soyuz rockets with one empty seat oh, or wow. two empty seats. Um, 
but it was a calculated risk yeah. because it meant leaving them on the station they didn't have a lifeboat gotcha. if they ended up needing it thankfully we never needed that but yeah there's only been one time that we've ever considered having people up there without a seat on a craft to come back immediately in case of an emergency gotcha and i'm, I'm scrolling through chat here seeing if there's any other questions uh that we missed and, and yeah uh dap dude that was the shuttle mission with only four crew the final one yeah <laughs> Gotcha. Yes, so uh, Astro YYZ, uh, good, there's a good point here. So um, the way the International Space Station works, there is the U.S. operating segment and the Russian operating segment. Uh, Canada, Japan, and Europe are included in the U.S. operating segment side of the station. So when we say the Russian side of the station, we do very literally mean just the Russian side of the station and the Russian crafts. When we right. say the American side of the station, we mean NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, JAXA from Japan. Um, that's where that, that's what we mean uh, by that. Um, so I was, I was trying to get you a diagram of the ISS, but uh, I'm not sure which one. I mean, here's one actually that's on NASA space flight. What is this from? Huh, a graphic on our website. Yeah, does? geez, what? I can use that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is this is about the new module. It looks like this is oh, now pressing forward. This is back from 2019 by Ian. But uh, let me see if I can get the graphic from this. Where is it? Yeah. Here uh, well, you're finding that. So uh, Ishan. Our Isan uh, wanted to know, so right now, uh, space missions to the ISS only use the Soyuz, um, and that's a question. Um, so um, right now, crew transportation to and from the station is only handled by the Soyuz rockets. Uh, that is set to change next month when SpaceX launches the first Crew Dragon with crew on board. Uh, for a multi-week mission to the International Space Station that will be followed very shortly by the first official crew rotation flight of Crew Dragon. Uh, once Dragon is up and operational, uh, Russia will do two crew flights a year, and the U.S. providers will do two flights a year. Um, Each provider or between the two of them? Between the two of them, okay. they will each do two. So uh, under normal operating circumstances for the normal crew rotations, Dragon will fly once a year, Starliner will fly once a year, unless one of them has a problem and the other one can pick up the slack right, and do the two. Um, there are other missions that the U.S. vehicles can do, private astronaut missions up to the International Space Station that are in addition to the crew rotations. Gotcha. Um, but uh, Russia does cargo missions. Uh, two U.S. companies, SpaceX and Northrop Grumman, do cargo resupply flights to the station. They'll be joined uh, next year by uh, Dream Chaser cargo space plane as well for the U.S. side. Uh, and Japan has the HTV cargo vehicle that does cargo resupply runs up to the space station as well. Um, uh, Japan will retire the current version of the HTV cargo craft after the uh, main mission that is scheduled to launch HTV-9, and they will go to a new upgraded version of HTV called the HTV-X um, for their future resupply efforts of the station. So um, just like we saw Dragon version one, Cargo Dragon retire earlier this week with a successful landing in the Pacific, and it'll just be replaced by a newer version of Dragon, for cargo missions, Japan's doing the same thing, just right. retiring the older one and substituting a newer one. Gotcha. Yeah. And hey, while we were answering oh. that one, uh, we actually got a super chat question yeah. here. Uh, NASA Space Flight, do you think the USA will still keep Soyuz as a backup when Crew Dragon and Starliner are operational? That's what we were just talking about. Um, Crew Dragon's going to keep flying. and We were, yeah. We'll start flying, I guess. And Starliner will start flying one day, and we're going to keep flying Soyuz, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Soyuz is not going away. Um, I think that's one of the very unfortunate things that uh, kind of got out there in public perception, even though nobody said it, uh, was that these vehicles, the Dragon and Starliner, were meant to replace Soyuz. They're not. They're meant to augment right. Soyuz um, and take the burden away from Soyuz. As we were talking about earlier today, the United States, Japan, the European Space Agency, and Canada 
we owe a tremendous debt to Russia right. um, because it was never supposed to be this way that Russia would have to handle the entirety of crew launch capability to the station, um, which they have done amazingly well and, and wonderfully well since July of 2011 when the U.S. retired the shuttle fleet. Um, it was never supposed to be that way. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to Russia gotcha. for what they've done. Um, and now, just thankfully, we're able to get to a position where we can go to what it was always supposed to be, where the U.S. handles some of it, Russia handles some of it. We trade off. We do, you know, we do various things with each other right. um, in that regard. Um, but yeah, Soyuz is not going away. Americans will still keep flying on the Soyuz. Um, Steve Bowen will launch on Soy on the next Soyuz, Soyuz MS-17, in October of this year. Uh, Dr. Kate Rubens from NASA will fly Soyuz MS-18 a year from now right. up to the station, and Russians will fly on Dragon and Starliner. Gotcha. And I, I'm working on a bit of a thing here while you're talking, Chris. I, I don't mean to be looking off to the side, uh, yeah. but it was just... Well, we just got another super chat, too. Oh, we did? Um, from Armin24. I have no idea what 750 ISK is. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> but thank you. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, they have the question... Uh, with the extra people going to the station where there'll be new crew modules so everyone has a place to sleep, which is an excellent question. Um, and uh, the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, a private company called Axiom here in the United States uh, right. has received permission and plans from NASA to add commercial modules to the International Space Station, to the US segment of the station. Um, that would include not only laboratory space, but extra living space for crews who would be staying aboard the station. Um, you know, it's, um, the station isn't a, um, oh, chat went away. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, uh, the station does have individual crew rooms for the long duration crew members. Uh, short duration crew members, um, on board the station would simply just basically Velcro their sleeping bag to one of the surfaces in one of the modules and sleep there. Right. Um, if, if, if they had to do it that way. Um, so yes. Um, and yes, um, the other question that we got here was, uh, is Russia still planning to do paid space tourism flights? The answer is yes. Um, uh, you know, Russia is open to using those seats on the Soyuz, those open seats on the Soyuz, however, um, however they can. Uh, Anthony has a great question here. How do the Soyuz astronauts sleep in such a crunched capsule? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Well, this is where the little extra space in the orbital module um, comes in handy, where they can spread out. Um, but the Soyuz is not a comfortable vehicle to be in for a prolonged period of time, which is why we do the fast track six hour launch to docking rendezvous with crew Soyuz to, to alleviate, uh, uh, alleviate some of the stress that crews reported feeling when they were cooped up in Soyuz for two day rendezvous to the right. station. It was a, that was a huge reason why Russia also upgraded the Soyuz systems to be able to do these fast track rendezvous. So, yeah. so Chris, <laughs> what I'm what I'm working on here, uh, Chris B brought it to my attention that we have forty nine thousand nine hundred and thirty nine subs to the channel right now. Forty nine thousand nine hundred what? At nine hundred and thirty nine. So we're sixty one uh, subs away from fifty thousand on the channel. We could do that, guys. Come on. If you're watching, give us a subscribe. But, but, but seriously, you know, if you're watching this, we do ask that you like and subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications. We don't spam you. We're not a channel that comes on with random things. Um, it's always spaceflight related. Um, we have our weekly live show where we deep dive into specific topics. Uh, we have these live streams um, of launches, dockings, events going on in space. So if you do appreciate what we do give us a like um Keep talking, give us a Chris. follow it's at 49960 uh, now we mentioned it and it went up by 25 let me refresh there again. we go so <laughs> so it's so, 87 yeah, now and, and, wait no it's 987 yeah. now <laughs> so we'll get there but <laughs> but yes um oh and uh janik uh, is asking about the next generation of russian spacecraft um the thing that will replace the soyuz um <laughs> 
And yes, this is a thing. Um, it is a it is a capsule um, that looks very much like um, uh, it, it looks very much like um, like Crew Dragon and Starliner in that regard. It is a radical departure away from um, uh, away from the Soyuz. Um, it is in development. It is intended to not just be able to take a crew of four. Uh, to Earth, Earth orbit, but also beyond Earth orbit for missions lasting up to 30 days. Um, huge improvement over the Soyuz. The Soyuz can stay docked for about seven months total. Um, the next generation craft called Orel, um, which means eagle uh, in Russian, it will be capable of staying docked to the International Space Station for a full year gotcha. instead of six months. Um, it can spend 200 days docked to a lunar gateway. Hint, hint, hint. Hint, um, hint. Nice. And it can also perform uh, up to 14-day free flights with a crew of four to six on board um, with a much larger... So remember those internal volumes of five cubic meters and 2.5 cubic meters, so a total of 7.5 cubic meters for Soyuz? Yeah. Yeah, the Orel will have 18 cubic meters gotcha. of livable space. Inside, so, uh, but it is in development. Um, it's made in launch as of the latest available data is, um, which was as of November of last year, its first uh, uncrewed test flight is scheduled for 2023. Right. Its first crew flight is scheduled for 2025 and Russia hopes to send it on an uncrewed lunar orbit test in 2026 as well. Gotcha. So yeah. Um, and it's a huge, huge. Oh, I've got a graphic. We can actually ship, put it up, Doss. Oh, nice. Um, hey, yeah, get that to yeah, me. me, and me... While you were talking, we actually ticked over fifty thousand subs on the channel. Very nice. Very <laughs> we're at 50, nice. That's what we like to see. Now. So everybody that uh, that was clicking the button or whatever it was, uh, I just we noticed that it was super close, and I figured I would mention it. And we literally just poof just blew past it over the course of the description there. But everybody everybody who, what are we, were on YouTube, rang the bell or whatever you're supposed to do, uh, to follow the channel, sub to the channel, whatever. We really appreciate y'all hanging out and supporting us. This And look at this. Mm -hmm. Over here we've got Blessing who did 50 euros in Super Chat. Blessing. Very nice. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the 50 euros. And then Jared did another five bucks on top of that with some sort of dancing, it's like an eggplant or something. 40 i have <laughs> yeah, no clue I know what that is but yes i have no clue what that little symbol is it looks like klingon uh from nyan there <laughs> it does <laughs> it does it looks like klingon i love it 40 klingon dollars or whatever that is i'm not sure <laughs> so rubles well, we oh. become interstellar now oh. you know we do broadcast into space our first broadcast has just reached the klingon homeworld um <laughs> that's kerbox uh, but... dog Anyways, but thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for interrupting me because uh, that's a huge milestone, and thank you to everyone who did super chats um, yeah. as well. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, Doss, I did throw up the, the it, graphic for the RL and the Soyuz. Yeah, here um, we go. Let me get it back here. over here. So, <laughs> Space so Cookie says, that. "Don't diss the Klingons." I would never disrespect a Klingon. I've watched way too much Star Trek to know that doesn't end well. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's usually blades involved, right? <laughs> um, so here's your graphic up on the screen. Yep. So here they are. So the Orel capsule. Uh, so Soyuz is the green one over there. Um, and Das, do you want to? Uh, Highlight the center portion, the the crew portion right of here. it, of where the crew lives. Yeah, got it. That's the crew. Portion. Yeah, so that center portion is the descent module. It's basically where the crew really lives. It's where they launch and land in. The module directly above it, they have access to. It certainly helps um, for longer stays in the Soyuz. But even so, the combined total volume that they have to live in is only seven and a half cubic meters. Um, like 350 cubic feet for those of you who don't do the metric system. Right. Um, the Orel, which is to the right of it, in two different service module configurations. Um, and Orel means eagle. Um, Soyuz means unity, by the way. Um, uh, so this is its different configurations, but the same basic capsule that um, has 18 cubic meters of living space, a heck of a lot more than Soyuz, 
brand new system, state of the art design, right? Um, and and then you can see it's two different service module configurations for depending on how long the mission might actually be, um, right there. But that's that's RL, and it's it's definitely coming. It's definitely on its way. Um, it is. Um, what, what what is interesting is that it's not um, the Soyuz that we just saw launch it, right? Won't be able to launch it. Um, okay, it's too so big. So we need a new. So we either need the new version of Soyuz called the Soyuz Five, <laughs> or the Ertish rocket, as it is called. Right. Um, it's a planned Russian rocket in development. Uh, right now, it would be a three-staged orbit um, vehicle capable of taking eighteen thousand kilograms to low Earth orbit or five thousand kilograms to GTO. Um, comparable to the Atlas Five, Five Four One, or the Falcon Nine, or the Falcon Heavy, or the Ariane Five. Yeah, Chris, um, is it spelled Oral or or, or L? A L or E L? Uh, Orel, O R E L. E L. Okay, good. I was I was writing on the screen, and then I realized I might not know how to spell it correctly. So, yeah. Um, but so we could either use that, the Soyuz Five. We could use the Angara rocket, um, or we could use the Russ M rocket uh for it um which would ironically use the same rd 180 engines that the atlas 5 uses gotcha <laughs> okay <laughs> um yes uh, good engines. but anyway um but that's that's it was a great question because that is russia's new um that's russia's new vehicle that they've got coming online cool well, I, I hope my annotations on the screen helped. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. I tried to write so that it was readable, legible, but you know, it's hard for me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you're just joining us um, uh, for the thousand of you that are watching right now, uh, we had a successful launch of the Soyuz MS-16 uh, crew vehicle to the International Space Station. First launch of humans on board the Soyuz 2.1A all digital flight control system rocket um, from Russia, or from Kazakhstan, actually. Uh, it did a six hour rendezvous with the station mm -hmm. and successfully docked um, about 25 minutes ago at uh, 10 13 uh, Eastern or 14 13 UTC. So, first try. Uh, they are docked. Yep. So, they are docked. Um, Bolts have driven. Soyuz is hard docked. So, the next event will be, um, which um, we will not stick around for. Um, will yeah. be a uh, hatch opening uh, and the welcome aboard ceremony. Because um, that's a that's a for hour Chris or two, Cassidy, right? uh, Ivana Shin, and Ivan Wagner. Gotcha. That's like an hour or two away. That's not. They don't just dock and instantly. Uh, open the door. Yeah, yeah. And that one's always kind of hard to nail down an exact time because they have to do. Um, uh, uh, they have to do leak checks. They have to go through all these, you know, ver various things um, to, they to make sure it's safe to hatch. open the hatches between the two vehicles. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So I got a couple more questions. Um, yeah. Really quickly. Yeah. I can do one real quick. Das, did you get any sleep? Uh, no, I haven't slept since we did the first live stream. Um, so I've been up. Thanks for asking. Here's one. NASA Space Flight, uh, what is the difference from Soyuz MS mission and the Soyuz Expedition mission? Is there a difference there? Or is, is MS-16... Is so, that, is that Soyuz MS, yeah, so they're different expedition? things. Um, so MS-16 is the name of the Soyuz flight there and back from okay. the station. They always technically remain Soyuz MS-16 crew members. Okay. Um, throughout their stay on the station. But they've launched on the Soyuz MS-16 flight to join the Expedition 63 crew uh, on board the International Space Station. Uh, and they will become the Expedition 63 crew um, okay. when the other three leave. Um, they'll be the only three on board the station so until Expedition Dragon gets there next month. 62 is on the station right now, right? Like right now on ISS is Expedition 62? Is that how that I works? I believe it is. I believe it's Expedition sixty three right now. Is the okay. current expedition? Because um, right. it's 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 kind of weird how they do it. Um, yeah. It is the current. Um, so Expedition sixty two. 
Yes, Expedition 63 is the current expedition. It began with the undocking. Nope, I'm sorry, Expedition 62 is current. Um, so Oleg Skaprochka, Jessica Mir, and Andrew Morgan are on board the station right now, ready to open the hatches to welcome Ivana Shin Wagner and Cassidy uh, on board. When Soyuz MS-15 leaves in, um, in a few days, um, it will mark the commencement. Undocking will mark the commencement of the start of uh, Expedition 63. Gotcha. So, so it's not necessarily yeah. who specifically is on the station. It's just like they put these designators, and it's like 62 starts, 62 stops, 63 starts, 63 stops, right? Yes, and they and they do that by when the ve when vehicles depart right. from the International Space Station. So okay. when the three-person crew who are Expedition 62 right now, when they undock from the station in a few days, that's the end of Expedition 62 and the beginning of Expedition 63. So that's how they do it. Okay. Um, exactly how they will do it and what the expedition numbering scheme will become once dragons start flying as oh, well. Geez is a little bit up in the air. Um, it should follow the same sequence that it did when we had four Soyuzes a year. Um, but of note, the expedition will not change. Right. Um, uh, they've been kind of um, upfront about this, that Expedition 63 will begin with the undocking of Soyuz MS-15 in a couple of days. Right. Uh, the expedition will consist of Commander Chris Cassidy, who will take command of the station, as well as Ivanishin and Wagner. Um, and the expedition will end in October of 2020 when the Soyuz here um, will be joined by the Soyuz MS-17, the next one. So at least through October, even with DM-2 from SpaceX going up and the first crew flight, the first crew rotation flight, of um, uh, with, with a dragon, right now they're saying the expedition number won't change with that dragon arriving with a new crew, a new four person crew set for the station. So we will see if that changes, but right now that's what it is. Gotcha. Um, let's see here. That was that, we got this one. Oh. Here's a quick one. Are the Russian and U.S. sides connected with a door, or are they sealed off? Like, can you float from the Russian side to the I, to the mm -hmm. American side, to the international side? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. They're, they're, they're open, free access. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, do we know when Na Nauka, how, how do you pronounce it? Nauka? Oh, Nauka, yeah. Um, is there a date for that yet? Hi. Oh, when Nauka will launch is just such a question. Um <laughs> Uh, it is assigned to launch to the earlier uh, to the International Space Station no earlier than June of 2020. It will most likely launch sometime in early 2021. Gotcha. Is the yes? Um, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those no earlier. No, no, things, no. Right? I mean, it's it's it's. I I kind of sigh because it's. It's a module, like, it's Russia's main science lab. Right. Like, th this is what Nauka is. And it's just, it was supposed to go up in, uh, when was it originally supposed to launch? Um, um, plans for it just kept changing early on in the International Space Station program in terms of what it would be and what it would serve as and i believe it was originally supposed to go up sometime in 2008 2000 yep um perspective launch date at the end of 2008 is when this module was originally supposed to launch and it's still on the ground in 2020. um so yeah when it will launch who knows um yeah. Gotcha. No, no, no. But, hey, that's the, again. We yeah. we don't have a crystal ball, right? We can sort of report what we yeah. what we think the schedule is and that sort of stuff. But uh, that that is what it is. Here's another one. Yeah. Um, a really quick yeah. one again about the the Soyuz mission. Why do the astronauts stay on the space station for so long? And that was Anthony asking that one. Why do they stay? Why don't they just go for a week and then come back down again? 
Right. So um, six month increments up to the International Space Station give you enough time to train crew to do very specific tasks, right? Like some of the astronauts have very specific spacewalk training for very critical things that we're going to do outside the station. Some of them just have basic like, oh, no, something broke and we've got to go fix it. Do you know how to get into a spacesuit, you know, and 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 work? Um, but the thing to remember here, too, is that a lot of the science that goes up on board the International Space Station, right? The longer you're on something, the more acclimated you become to it, the easier it becomes to interact with it. And six month is the sweet spot with crews needing to um, needing to upkeep the space station with maintenance, needing to perform science activities on board the complex, uh, all the visiting vehicles that arrive that have to be unloaded and then reloaded with disposable cargo, um, and and also you know these these launches are not cheap, right. um, so you know a Soyuz. Oh, 90 times three a soyuz is rough a crew launch for a soyuz is around 300 um is around 250 million or something like that right um uh just based on the price per seat um i'm horrible at math so bear with me for a second um but like 87 million times three is 261 million so it costs 261 million to launch crew to the international space station right we can't be doing that every week right you know um so four crew launches a year for regular iss crew rotations is is the sweet spot for the crew that we have and overlap and making sure it's manned and staffed and crewed and all of that gotcha so so i yeah. i had a question that i came up with and, and i guess i get to ask yeah. the question as well yeah. um we talked earlier this when you were talking about the pricing this just popped into my mind we talked earlier about right now, if a U.S. astronaut wants to go to the space station, they ride a Soyuz. And we pay Russia for that. We pay for that seat, right? Um, we then we indeed. also said that Russian cosmonauts will be riding on American rockets from American soil. On Okay, you get it. Um, is Russia going to pay us for the seat if they ride on a dragon? Right. It's an excellent question. The, the basic answer is... No. Okay. Um, what we would do is basically a seat swap. So instead of us paying Russia for one of our crew members to launch on Soyuz MS-17, let's say the next one, gotcha. and Russia then turning around and paying us to put a crew member on Dragon Crew 2, right, launching a couple months later, let's say. This is all notional, right? We right, do right. not take this timeline in any degree of sure. reality. For the sake of discussion. Um, yeah, instead of just handing money back and forth to one another, what we'll do is we'll do seat swaps. It's what we did during the shuttle era. It's uh. what we did. Um, it's what we've done before. And the way we'll work out. So what's interesting is that basically for a Russian crew member flying on a Dragon capsule, it's not equal, right? Because right. we're paying Russia $87 million for a, and it's a $55 million seat on a Dragon. Right. right, according to the OIG Office of the Inspector General report from a few months ago. Sure. Um, so we will we we will correct that monetary imbalance through other ways, gotcha. like oh, you need cargo launched, and you're owed forty million dollars. Let's say the difference owed is forty million dollars. Okay. Right. And oh, you need cargo launched. Well, how about we launch forty million dollars worth of cargo on one of our resupply craft? Right. Right. And you and you balance and you do the balancing act that way. Now, the good news with Starliner, according to the OIG report, is that Starliner costs a bit more than <laughs> than a seat so on the Soyuz. That helps balance it out. Uh, Ninety million versus eighty-seven million. So it's kind of a wash. Right. With Starliner, that's but yeah, sort of, we, that's we'll sort of seat swap and we'll find other ways to make it fair, I, you know, across the board. Well, I, that's so. So that strikes me as sort of weird because it's cheaper to launch on a Dragon, but if you get a significantly human being cheaper to space on a Dragon, you also have to give them cargo as well. Does that make this, this yes. seems sort of weird? Just because Dragon is is cheaper. <sighs> Uh, does, does that make well, sense? But, but so, like so, so the, the, so the price per seat, yeah, so the price per seat calculation that the OIG, the Office of Inspector General did for Starliner and, and Dragon, right? Right. 
not only includes the money that went in, the total money that went into their build and operations and everything right, right. like that, right? And and now now that they're built, what would the charge be? Right. What would you charge someone for the seat to, you know, break even more or less? Huh. Well, that includes all the personal cargo the crew has to take up with them. Sure. On those missions. Um, so in, in that regard, the 55 million for a dragon, the 90 for a, um, for a Starliner and the 87 million for a Soyuz right. seat include all the crew personal items that have to launch with them. Gotcha. Um, now, a lot of times too, we also pre-launch stuff for crew members right. on these cargo missions, right? Um, or we wait to make sure they got there and then launch it, things on the next mission, like, um, specifically things they have to interact with. Like, remember Simon, the big round soccer ball thing that launched a couple of years ago up right. to the station on a European astronaut's mission? Right. Um, like, they waited until he got there and then launched it on the next resupply mission. You know, launched Simon on the next one. Gotcha. Once they knew his crew member was actually on the station. So it is interesting how we balance it. But yeah, yeah it it's, it's, it'll out. be a balancing act. It's, it's just sort of yeah. weird because it's like one human to space does not equal one human to space. You know you know what I mean? That's where I had the disconnect. It, well, I was like, right. Hmm. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just scrolling through, I know there's so many good questions. We're never able to get to every single question. Uh, there's just all sorts. And some questions that we just talked about, like what uh, what rocket will Oral launch on and, and that sort of stuff. Orel, sorry, pronounced that incorrectly. Um, but there was another question that came through that, that I sort of held back on because it didn't have anything to do with the docking of the space station right now. It wasn't Soyuz or an MS-16, but I want to toss this out here for you, Chris. Um, the question was, and let me go find it again. This was from Nyan again, and it was, what's going on with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 right now? So I figured we could sort of close out. Oh, what a delightful there. question. Yeah, I love there you this. Go. I love I the like Voyagers. <laughs> So run with uh, it. Well, the good news. Well, the good news is uh, not a lot. That's okay, right? Because Don't we're lie. in power conservation mode in them to try to make the uh, the um, um, oh my god, the nuclear power source that they right. have last as long as possible. The RTG. Um, yes, the RTG. Yes, thank you. Um, the um, both of them are functional. Right. Uh, we had a little bit of a scare with Voyager two. Uh, a few months ago where it had a fault, it went into safe mode, stopped doing things, and we were able to talk to it. Right. It's over, oh my gosh, it's it's up to like, I think it's 17 hours of light time. Light time. One way, communication of light time. 17 hours, if we send a command to the Voyager, to one of the Voyagers, it's roughly 17 hours for it to get to them. Yeah. I'm, I'm Googling it. Right now. Oh, Voyager 1 is 20 hours away. There we go. 20 hours and 20 34 hours. light hours away. So Voyager 2 is 18? Uh, Almost let's 19. See. Voyager 2 is... six. This one says 16, but this was from 2018. Google didn't give me an instant answer on that, but I'll keep so there, Googling. So it's probably 17 at yeah, this point. Yeah. Um, 17, 18 at this point. But yeah, that's one-way communication. So like when Voyager had its Voyager two had its problem and sent back, it's like, oh no, I stopped because I don't know what to do. Um, it took eighteen hours for that to reach us, and then we had to figure out what to send back to it to try to get it out of safe mode and figure out what went wrong. Um, and then we sent it back and it took 17 hours for that signal to get to Voyager 2 yep. for Voyager 2 to execute it and then send a signal back. So we're talking, you know, like it's taking three days, you know, just to go like, Oh crap, something's wrong. Okay. Try this. Okay. I tried this. It did or didn't work. Yeah. You know, like, and it took three days to do that. Um, but the Voyagers are awesome. They're still functioning. They're collecting immense amount of data about the interstellar medium. Both right. of them passed out of the solar system. Uh, sorry, both of them passed out of the heliosphere Helio yeah. of the solar system and, and technically entered interstellar space, even though they're still technically in the solar system. Yes, I know it's confusing, but 
basically this, the solar system is defined as the sun's gravity sphere of influence, which right. is a lot farther out than uh, where the heliosphere ends. Um, so, but I hopped yeah, over Voy to Voyager now. two. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, but Vo Voyager one crossed out in 2012. Voyager two crossed out um, a couple of years ago, um, and 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 just provided us a sheer amount of data about what the outer edge of the sun's influence is. And there they are. They're yeah. talking to the it's deep space network right now. right now on Canberra, through Canberra, <laughs> yeah, in Australia. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so the, the, the sad thing about the Voyagers, it will be a very sad day. Um, they will eventually run out of power, we believe, sometime between 2025 and 2030. Um, where they just simply will not have enough power to keep the bat to keep their systems from freezing. Right. And that's what will ultimately do them in. Um, it will definitely be a sad day when we lose the Voyagers. I know personally when Voyager two had its problem, um, that I, I like, I had an immediate emotional reaction to it. Right. Like, no, 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 no. Like I am not ready to lose one of these things, you know, <laughs> like... they've been going for 42 years. 42 years yeah they're older than i am and i'm old yep and they were not supposed to function this long god i mean they were supposed to do the grand tour of jupiter saturn uranus and neptune and maybe function a little bit more after that and 42 years later they are still returning data and helping us learn that's a good investment. About the solar system. One of those, uh, <laughs> yeah, and one of the most fascinating things, um, they're about, Voyager 1, I believe, is about 145, 46, 47 uh, astronomical units away. An astronomical unit being, oh, there they yeah. are, 148 yeah. AU and 123 AU. Um, distance from Earth, um, AU is the distant, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. An astronomical unit. Um, so it's 148 times that and 123 times that. Um, right now they are yeah um but one of the cool things is that the voyagers and with all the probes we have throughout the solar system there was a coronal mass ejection a couple of years ago that was ejected outward toward mars thankfully right. not earth but um, ejected outward toward mars all of our solar observatory fleet close in the inner solar system watched it all of our probes orbiting Mars and on the surface of Mars, all of our little rovers and probes caught it and measured it as it came, as the mass ejection came by Earth. Um, New Horizons measured it as it went by New Horizons out in the Kuiper Belt. Right. And then one of the Voyagers caught it as well uh, before it exited the solar system, gotcha. uh, before it exited the heliosphere. And it was the first time in history that we were able to track a coronal mass ejection from its origination to the end point of the sun's sphere of influence. Right. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without the Voyagers still functioning. Yeah. And just to follow yeah. up on that, uh, the Voyagers are not solar paneled, solar, solar paneled, solar powered, right? They are they powered are not, by they the are, They have radioactive thermo radioactive thermo radio generation. I thermo forget what the T stands. generator <laughs> there you go thermoelectric yeah. there we go oh, i couldn't remember the electric it's incurable yes. so that's, uh, that's so, why i know yeah yeah so ba basically they're nuclear powered and there is a finite amount that they have gotcha for that and we know that um yeah so I actually uh, installed NASA's Eyes on the Solar System real quick, which is a free yes. app you can get from JPL to visualize the status of different missions. And I hopped over to Voyager 1 because I was trying to figure out how impossibly far Voyager 1 is from everything else we oh know God. right now. And, get uh, ready. <laughs> yeah. I can't even really put it on the screen very well just because it's so far away. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. It is, I mean, there's the orbit of yeah. Neptune, right? Yeah. And Voyager is just all the way out in the system. But uh, anyways, it, it, I was trying and, to come up with a visual aid for it. So, Yeah, and, and, and the last thing I'll say about the Voyagers, too, it's a great visual aid. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it really is because it's just so far out there. Um, but what's great about the Voyagers is they're escaping on different trajectories. Right. So when we flew Voyager, when we made the decision to fly Voyager 1 by Titan, 
and sacrifice and thereby sacrifice a Voyager one's ability to go to Uranus and Neptune. Right. Uh, in favor of Titan, we actually that flyby of Titan flung it out of the ecliptic plane of the solar system. So yeah. it's actually escaping to the south of the solar system. You could, you whereas could see that. Voyager two is exiting along the plane of the solar system because of how we sent it by Uranus and Neptune, um, yeah. or I should say, more in line with the with the ecliptic plane of the solar system for where Voyager two is, but. Um, yeah, just I'm looking for Voyager two in here, but I just is I just, it a subheading under Voyager one or do they just have Voyager one? I see Voyager one. Oh, there we go. Two, 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 two. Go back down. There we well, go. That's two flying by Uranus and Neptune, but I don't see how to get to Voyager. There's oh, gotta be a search. like an ability to actually track it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, interesting. It's been a while, but I know that there's got to be some sort of search or something in here. But anyways, all right. Um, yeah. Gosh. Well, we've gone through an awful lot of questions that. here, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Do we have? Do we maybe one more? Do we, we have time for one more? Well, you know what the one more question is: Are you are you going to stay alive until the hatch opens? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Doss needs to sleep, and uh, no, and I need to open up the door to my office so I can get air conditioning in here because it's oh, going wow. to be ninety here in Florida today. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, so uh, I guess we are sort of coming up on the... Do we know what time the hatch is going to be? Because NASA TV usually covers that, right? Do we have a time for that? Or N- is it... N- NASA TV does cover it. Um, right. I mean, it's usually an hour and a half to two hours after docking. So okay. 30 minutes to an hour from now gotcha. um, is when we can expect it. But yeah. I'm, um, I'm seeing if I can Google it real quick and just see if NASA has announced the live stream at a certain time or something. Oh, oh, they, they have. Hang on, I oh, got it. I got, got it. it. Yeah, yeah, here um, we go. Did I get yeah. that up? Yeah, it's it currently says that uh, the oh, hatch yeah. is supposed to open yeah. around twelve thirty p.m. Eastern. So that's still an hour and a half from now. So an hour and a half from now. Yep. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not staying up that long. I think I think Das wants to sleep, and uh, so do I. <laughs> yeah. So let me just make sure I didn't miss anything else. Uh, it looks like we're all good. That looks good. Soccer balls, etc. I don't see anything else I miss. Um, so again, LF Domino, you just asked when are they going to open the hatch. I literally Googled MS-16 hatch opening, and it reported that uh, they're expecting that to happen around 12.30 p.m. Eastern uh, from the Google results here. But for us, we've been streaming for an awfully long uh, night here. We did the launch of MS-16 at what? Like We started the stream at 3 a.m. Eastern time, which was eight hours yeah, ago. Yes. <laughs> Eight, three to seven. I can't even math anymore. Whatever. Um, many hours ago. And then we tried to cover the Long March 3B launch, the Chinese rocket launch. Unfortunately, there was no live video of that, but we did build one in Kerbal and, and launch it. And then we covered the actual rendezvous and docking um, of MS-16 with yes. the International Space Station. It's been a long session, we- Chris. It is, and and it's worth noting. It's a mixed bag uh, of results today. Um, yeah. I'm very happy that the crew launch went perfectly, um, and that the crew docking went perfectly to the International Space Station. So everything with Soyuz 16 was perfect by the yep. book. Uh, unfortunately, it does appear that the Long March 3B rocket had a third stage failure that resulted in the satellite not even making orbit right. and destructively re-entering the atmosphere. So we'll wait to see what more we get from that. Um, as the day progresses so definitely watch um at nasa space flights twitter feed and or mine um at chris g underscore nsf um for more updates on that and um definitely a huge thank you to michael baylor who is producing this behind the scenes is he still um, awake michael you're for awake. us <laughs> and yes he said he was going to be on and working but not on comms for this one <laughs> um but Michael was with us for the launch of Soyuz MS-16 as well as, as the docking and a huge thanks to him. And a huge thanks to everyone who watched. Again, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel. We don't spam you with random videos. It's all cool space stuff like what we've done today. Yeah, and I'm putting these links in chat, Chris, as you're saying them. Uh, again, I put the link to the NASA JPL Eyes on the Solar System, that app that allows you to sort of explore the, the missions that are going on in exoplanets and stuff. That was the first link I put there. Uh, Twitter.com slash NASA Spaceflight is the official Twitter feed of NASA Spaceflight. Of course, the website's nasaspaceflight.com. And then I got Chris G there as well, uh, Chris G NSF. Uh, Chris G underscore NSF is how you can follow Chris 
on Twitter. And if you're looking for me for whatever reason, uh, you can find me at K Space Academy. So I am Das. I'm John Galloway with the Kerbal Space Academy. I stream on Twitch over there all the time as well. But uh, that is where you can find us when we are not streaming. But I think, Chris, good outro there. We sort of covered Yes, um, good outro. And I will just say um, I'm about to retweet something. Um, the Long March mission definitely failed. Ah. Um, Guam has it raining down, the debris raining down as it reentered the oh, atmosphere. Wow. So it failed very quickly on the third stage. Wow. Um, based on that, I'm hitting retweet on that right now. But yeah, we've got... Um, yeah, heard an ex uh, claim to have heard an explosion and then debris falling from the sky. Homeland Security says it is the Long March 3B failure re-entering the atmosphere. Wow. Okay, I, I wonder if anybody caught that on video. That would be a, a crazy thing to watch for on social media. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyways, y'all, um, trying to bring up the news as it comes through here. Uh, one more thing. Thank y'all so much. We crossed 50,000 subs. We're at 50,000 and 53 subs. So we, we went over 50,000, and we really appreciate y'all clicking the buttons on the channel because it, it means we're doing something right, right? And if it, we're bringing you content that you enjoy, uh, different sorts of q and I know you could watch the official NASA stream and, oh, just be quiet and just listen to Mission Control. You could do that, right? That stream's there. But if you if you like our q and and sort of our banter, and, I mean, I make jokes sometimes, if, if that's sort of is something that you enjoy we're, we're glad you're here sharing it with us and chris again thank you so much for for hanging out with me through all these streams today um i would not have wanted to do it by myself <laughs> too much um, talk. if you were talking to me Das, I, I can't hear you anymore for oh. some reason um so um uh yes but gotcha. it was it was a pleasure it was wonderful being um uh, it was wonderful uh, joining you for all of this. Uh, yeah. Until next time, all on right. my end. You knew exactly what I was saying, and now you're wondering what I'm saying, but uh, it's all good. So, <laughs> folks watching, we're going to go ahead and shut it down here. And uh, what our next stream, I don't know that we have our next stream. We're sort of watching what's going on with the launches happening down at Cape Canaveral, the Starlink launch that's coming up and stuff like that, seeing what we're going to be able to cover when it comes to social distancing, stay-at-home orders, is media going to be allowed at KSC? Uh, so be watching out. We don't have the next live stream scheduled. We can't tell you exactly when the next time we're going to do this launch coverage is, but uh, we hope you enjoyed it today. Uh, oh. Actually, I got audio back, so I can hear you. Okay, now. so you can hear me. Now. Um, do we uh, know we, for sure? Well, we we do. Okay. Um, um, we we have been told that space will be limited um, at the Starlink launch right. on April sixteenth because of COVID nineteen and and, um, and and all the safety precautions that need to be followed. Right. Um, once we get confirmation that we are one of the media outlets that are allowed in, right. we will go ahead and let you know. But um, as of right now, the yes, they are letting media in, just restricted like they have in the past. Gotcha. So in terms That's of launch coverage, As of Thursday, April 9th at 11 a.m. There you go. This changes constantly every <laughs> single day. <laughs> it really does. But uh, the next launch stream that we would be covering, I guess, would be April 16th. Uh, but the next yep. stream here on the channel will be this Saturday, NASA Space Fight Live. We're still doing that at 5 p.m. on Saturday. So you like the live We content. are, and are we, are we ready to announce who the special guest is for that? That's up to you. I mean, As I, I now look at Discord to see if this person will answer me live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's, our, it's the third episode of our weekly live show um, this Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, uh, I believe that's... 2,100 hours or 2,100 hours, uh, 2,100 hours UTC right. on Saturday. Um, this way that we will have a special guest, um, although I don't think we're ready to say exactly who that is yet. Uh, we're waiting we to see have if a the special, special guest. guest will say. Let's say that he's not. He's oh, he's typing. He's typing. Hang he's on. typing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't repeat that. Um, can you say but... <laughs> that on TV? Like, <laughs> oh, we can say whatever we want technically, but I don't want to. Um, uh, and anyway, yes, please join us for that. We will deep dive into several topics, um, not just events of the week, but um, some other topics that, you know, don't get as much coverage um, as they normally do that we want to just sort of deep dive into. Um, but yeah, it's, it'll be a good show. Please, please make a point to join us. Gotcha. All right, folks. So we've been just talking. We just won't shut up. Apparently we like space or something or we, we like live streams. We yeah. like hanging out with y'all. But uh, it is time for us to go ahead and roll the credits here. And Chris, one more time, thank you so much. And we will see y'all next time. Look for us this weekend. And 
look for Boca Chica videos every day here on the channel. You know how to find us if you need us. It's probably over on that side. But for now, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Pressure looks good.